glad for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Oh, come on. We can do better than that. Hallelujah. He is worthy of our praise, our honor, and our glory. The Bible says to clap your hands, all your people, and to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. You know, we live in a day where we can be loud at everything in the world except church. We feel like if we get loud in church that we're undignified, that we look ridiculous, that we look just crazy. But you know, there's a story in the Bible of a man that looked ridiculous. He looked crazy. And the one that thought he looked ridiculous and that thought he looked crazy was his wife. As David saw the Ark of the Covenant coming back to its rightful place, the Bible says he danced joyously before the Lord. And Saul's daughter, it doesn't even say David's wife, but Saul's daughter looked out there and said, look at him all undignified, acting like a fool. I'm putting it in today's terms. We'll get fired up at a ball game. Man, when, my, when I watched the World Series this past year, I was a little boy wearing a towel with the last time that the Braves won the World Series. And I watched it this past year, and man, when them boys hit and them boys, I'd see that ball go flying. As soon as it come off the bat, I'd yell with everything I had. Then a few months later, the last time I watched the Georgia Bulldogs win a national championship, I had to go back before I was born and watch it. But this year, when I seen Keely Ringo jump up in the air and snatch that Heisman winning quarterback's ball out of the air, and I knew the game was over and tied in a knot, I yelled. I, my little boy was asleep on the couch. I ran over there and grabbed him up, shook him. I said, they won the national championship. I was excited, but we'll come to church, and we get dignified. I had a, right here in this very neighborhood, I had a man approach me one time. He said, I wish y'all keep it down over here. And it, then, as I respectfully, the best I could, told him, look, anything we've ever done over here, We've invited the neighborhood. We've never wanted to be a part, uh, you know, a, a thorn in our neighborhood side. But we have continuously had problems with you. I said, we got trucks squatted all day long riding up and down these roads with pipes, glass packs that's about to blow windows out and speakers bumping and playing and dirt bikes flying by your house. And I never see a deputy ride up. But the moment the church does something, we got a deputy riding up in the parking lot. And he said, well, I got a problem because you don't need all that noise to do what you're doing. I said, hold on respectfully one minute, sir. I said, my Bible tells me to sing unto God a new song and play skillfully with a loud noise. I said, the Bible says to praise him loudly on the timbrels and the cymbals and the stringed instruments. To play loudly. The Bible says to clap your hands on your people and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. When they was locked outside of Jericho's walls, the Bible says that when they was released to speak, they spoke with a shout and the walls came falling down. So don't tell me I'm supposed to be quiet and I'm supposed to look all religious and perfect and political in the church. You might see me acting a little crazy. But if David act crazy, I'm in good company. If Peter looked crazy, I'm in good company. If Paul looked crazy, I'm in real good company. If Jesus looked crazy when, 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 the, when Pilate looked at him and said, people say that you're the king of the Jews. Are you? You said it. I imagine he said, you're crazy. You're a fool. You have the chance to save your life, and you're going to sit here and act like a fool. See, the world thinks foolishness of the cross. The Bible says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that perish. So don't ever let the world tell you that you can't get excited about serving God. Amen. So one more time, will you put your hands together and lift up the name of Jesus? So good to see each and every one of you in the house. Before you're seated, we'll go ahead and read our text this morning. 
I'm going to be in the book of Psalms number 37, 1 through 9, and Psalm 73, numbers 1 through 10. We're going to go ahead and read both of those, and I want you to kind of look at the similarities between these texts written by two different men of the, of the same heart. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of whom because of him whom prospereth in his ways, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Let's go to Psalm 73, numbers 1 through 10. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Listen to how encouraging that is. This is written by King Asaph. He says, or the chief musician Asaph. He says, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But now watch the tide turn. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. For they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. Will you stretch your hands this way? Pray for me as I pray for you. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your many blessings. I thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I pray, O oh God, that you would just have your divine way. Let me decrease that you might increase. Let the anointing of your Holy Spirit take this service, O oh God. It is your anointing that destroys the yoke. We trust in you, O oh God, to do what only you can do in this place today. I pray that every ear be anointed to hear, every mind be anointed to understand, and every heart be anointed to receive. Lord, what your Spirit is saying unto the church. I ask, Lord, for your guidance through this service, through this day. And we're going to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. And the church says... Amen. Slap two or three people as you're being seated. Tell them how good it is to see them in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. So good to have you with us. Welcome to Northwoods Church. If you're watching online, welcome to Northwoods Church. We are so glad to have you with us. God is doing great and mighty things, not just in Northwoods Church, but in the kingdom of God. You can look at the world every day and you can say, you can argue with me. God ain't doing a whole lot of good. But I'm here to tell you today, if you can see what God has put in plan, his plan that he has put in motion, if you can see the wisdom of God, you remember a message I preached a few weeks ago that the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the unction of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you have been given an unction by the Holy One. That unction is the same word anointing, and the word anointing doesn't just refer to the power of God or the power of his Spirit. It also comes with the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So when you can rely on that unction or that anointing of the Holy Spirit, you can see things a little differently. Amen. You can see the Bible playing, get being played out. You can see, I know how the book ends, and I know that there's some, there's some chapters that, man, I really don't want to go through, but I know how the book ends with a big amen, and, and God's victorious, and his people are victorious. So I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, seeing through the smoke, seeing through the smoke. Last week, we, I preached the sermon, Can You Stand When the Heat Is Turned Up? And we talked about the three Hebrew children who had their Hebrew names, but because 
uh, the Babylonian king didn't, didn't like their names or didn't like what their names meant. He changed their names to what the world knows them as, is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which took the name, meaning of their name and made it to Babylonian gods. And then when they were given the opportunity to, you know, to worship in public this idol, they didn't do it. So the king brought them in and tested their faith in what they believed, and he said, listen, and I'm paraphrasing this, I'm putting it in my own terms, but the king had already said, if you don't bow to this idol, you're going to be thrown into the fire. But when these three Hebrew children didn't bow to the idol, he brought them into his office. He went back on his word. He brings them into the office. He says, I'm going to give you a second chance. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do in private what you should have done in public. I am going to see if you're walking around talking about your Jehovah is just for a public persona or are you the real deal? Do you really believe what you say? So I'm going to give you an opportunity in private. Nobody in public is going to know that you ain't living the life you say you have. Nobody in public is going to know you denied Jehovah. But if you don't want to go in this fiery furnace, when the music starts playing, I'm going to need you to bow and worship. And they said, and who is the God that is going to deliver you from the fiery furnace and my hand? And then the, the three Hebrew children said it, and I love how they said it. They said, oh, King Neb, oh, Neb, we ain't a, we, we're not careful to answer you in this situation. We don't even have to think about this answer. We're not even, we don't even have to huddle up and pray about what we're going to say. We know what the Word of God says. We know what God says. He is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace and from your hand. And even if he don't, O oh, King, we will not bow to your King. We will not bow to your idol. And of course, we know the story. They heated it up three times or seven times hotter. And the mightiest men were, took the three Hebrew children and threw them into the fire. The, the, the circumstance got so hot, the wrath was so fiery and so punishable that even the men that were involved in their death had, was, was slain at the gate of the fire. And they threw them in. And the only thing burned in the fire was the things that bound them, the things that tied them, the things that held them together, held them together. Bam. And that was the only thing that was consumed. And we know that Nebuchadnezzar saw the fourth man in the fire who appeared as the Son of God. I want to piggyback on that for a moment this morning. And I want to talk to you on this subject, seeing through the smoke. For those of you that don't know, before my Christian days and before I was serving in a church straight out of high school, I worked a little bit for a contractor for Georgia Power. But they didn't have any benefits, didn't have any plans. My dad was a police officer in Phoenix City, Alabama. And he told me, he said, Josh, the fire department is hiring. So I went, I put in my application, I got the job, and I spent the next six years as a firefighter in Phoenix City, Alabama. Worked 24 hours on, 48 hours off. All throughout my life, I thought what I thought I knew about fires. I thought I knew about fire safety until I became a firefighter. So if I ask you the question this morning, what is the most dangerous thing in a fire? Most people, obviously, it's going to be the smoke. You know, I done, told, I done gave you my title. But a lot of people would assume that the fire is the most dangerous or the heat is the most dangerous. But the most dangerous thing in a house fire, the most dangerous thing in any kind of structure fire is smoke. There are more deaths that are related to smoke inhalation throughout the year than there are to be people being burned. More people die in house fires because of smoke than they do because the fire got to them. 90% of people that we recovered from fires, as when I was a firefighter, didn't die from being burned alive. They died because of the smoke inhalation. For those of you that don't know, when you take a breath, you get about 21% oxygen. If you get, if it drops to 17%, you begin hallucinating. You begin losing coordination. You begin losing focus. You lose sense of direction. And a lot of people will take, and it doesn't take but two breaths in a house fire, in a fully, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a smoke-filled room, two breaths of, of all those car cities. It ain't like standing over a campfire. You're burning leather, you're burning plastic, you're burning trash, you're burning carpet, chemicals, glue, all that stuff that's, that's put holes that house together is on fire and, and, and being burned up into the smoke. Two breaths can render you unconscious. That's why so many people are found right there at the door. So many people are found right there at a window because they made a break for it. I can make it. And they hold their breath. But they took two little breaths and they passed out. 
Because if, you're, if you lose focus or you lose coordination, one breath at 17% or less can render you unconscious. If it doesn't cause you to fall unconscious, at 9%, you're guaranteed to be unconscious. But under 17% in, in, in a breath, if you get under 17% of oxygen flow, you're going to lose focus. You're going to be. You're going to lose sense of direction. And according, that isn't just my opinion, because according to the NFPA, smoke causes more fire deaths than flames because people are incapacitated by the fumes so quickly that they cannot get to safety. Smoke causes blindness, chokes out the oxygen in the air, and causes a lack of judgment and a loss of coordination. A firefighter's ability to see through the smoke is the difference between life and death. You know, when we was on the way to a fire, we would begin putting on our bunker gear, and while we're riding down the road, when you get into a fire truck, if you've never been in one, the air packs are in the seat. So when you get in, you, you, as soon as you slide in, you throw your arm through a strap, lean up, pull it, strap it, and then you start masking up. And by the time you get to that scene, you're ready to go in, and you're ready to grab a hose, and you're ready to start fighting fire, and start rescuing, and start making uh, a clearance. But it doesn't matter how much gear you put on. Whether I was a civilian walking into a fiery house or a firefighter covered in all this gear, it doesn't matter. When you walk into that fire and it's smoke-filled room, immediately you are blind. You can't see anything. When, when, that, when that fire's rolling and that smoke is being held in, you've got a hot, black, thick smoke, and you can't see anything. So there was this little thing on the truck that we called the heat-sensing uh, heat imagery. And we would take it. It looked like a little gun with a TV screen. And you could walk into a room, blind as a bat, and you could hold that thing down and look around, and you'll see it glowing anytime it comes across heat. Of course, in a fiery room, everything's going to be hot. But you can decipher the difference between body heat and a blazing flame over here to the side. So a firefighter's ability to see through the smoke can determine the difference between life and death. And when I began thinking about that and, and studying this week, I realized how often life circumstances also bring us to smoky rooms into our lives. It brings us to places in our life that we must be equipped to see through the smoke or it could cost us everything. David uttered these words in Psalms 119.83, For I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. Uh, when they would take the goat skins and the wine skins, they didn't have chimneys, but they would have a hole in the roof, and they would build a fire, and they would hang the skins over that fire, and that smoke that was, was funneling up out of that little hole in the roof would pass over the wine skins or the goat skins, and it would, it would cure, it would, it would shrink, it would tighten, and it would make tough the skin that was become the wine bottle. It would also uh, help the fermentation of the, of the fruits or the wines that were in the in the skins and that is where you get don't put old and new together don't put don't put the old wine skin into the new wine skin because it tears because there's a process in which that smoke would go up and that smoke would, would, would perform and make a tough skin and make it pure there are going to be times in your life that you've got to pass through the smoke. There are going to be there, the God is calling for some people in this day and hour that aren't afraid that when the when the when the sounds go off to jump on the truck and go to the house fire instead of run from the house fire. For he needs some folks that ain't scared to go into the prayer meeting instead of run from the prayer meeting. He needs some folks that ain't scared to get involved in the church instead of run from the events of the church. He needs some folks that ain't scared to go up to, to folks on the street and tell them about the love of Jesus instead of people that run from the embarrassment or the possibility of embarrassment. He needs some people that can see through the smoke, people that are carrying the, the imagery that can, that can give them the ability to save in the smoke. We see in Psalms 37 from David and also in Psalm 73 from Isaiah that their great frustration over the enemy flourishing and appearing blessed caused them anger. How many has ever felt like that in your life when you were trying to do what's right? You, you sacrifice, you give, you operate, you work, and you serve. And it seems like those that are against you, no matter what they touch, it blooms. No matter where they go, they just get piles of, I got people, I know people, I've been saved 50 years, and it just don't do me no good. My, the, they, they over here living like the devil, and they just still got all these things, and they're getting new cars every year, and they, they got a full bank account. 
And they look so blessed. And, and, you, and you begin focusing on what they're doing. If I go into a house fire trying to make a rescue, and all I can do is be amazed at the smoke in the room, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to possibly lose the opportunity to save a soul or to save a person because I'm so busy looking at the smoke in the room. I'm blinded by the smoke. I'm blinded by what's going on in front of me that I'm not looking through the smoke to what's lying on the floor or what's lying at the wall or what's lying at a corner. And you, we, we can sit here, we can say, well, that's a good metaphor, Brother Josh, but if I can be real with you this morning, I'm not doing this to, 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 to just try to paint or scare you, but it's the truth of life. One of the worst things you could ever do as a firefighter is to walk into a house, pull up on the street, and you see a mama and a daddy with a little bit of smut on her face, and they're crying, and you walk into that house to recover a little girl standing sitting behind a couch, or a little girl, or a little boy that's done crawled up under their bed. How is the mama and the daddy standing on the street and that baby's still inside without life in its body I would want to ask those questions I've never been in that position I would hope that before you found my baby inside that house you'd have to find me too but it was a hard thing to do. And when we start thinking about church and we start thinking about ministry and we start thinking about, you know, serving God and, and, and being on guard against the enemy, we always just paint this picture like when you get grown up, that's what you got to do. But the reality is, is the fire is not a respecter of persons. The fire doesn't check your ID to make sure you're 21 and above before it begins to attack. And there's too many people getting out of the fire. But your children are being left behind couches. And your children are being left under beds. And you're just saying, they'll figure it out. I told them how to get out. I told them where to go. No, put me on the floor. Let me crawl through every corner and every crevice. But I'm not leaving this fire until I got my family. I'm not leaving this fire until I got my wife I'm not leaving this fire because we came into the fire together we're going to leave together but I'm not giving up and I'm not quitting yeah, so many times in church as a pastor I have found myself wanting to run out of the burning house and leave my wife where she's at so many times my wife has wanted to run out of the burning house and leave me where I'm at but something we have discovered over time is there hadn't been a fire that's came our way that has been able to consume and destroy what God wasn't able to rebuild and repair greater than the first. Amen. He said the, 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 the latter end of this house shall be greater than the former house. I don't want to stay in the former house if I've got a latter thing that ought to be greater. Lord, put me through the fire. I don't want it. I'm not looking forward to it. But I'm looking forward to that day when I step on God's celestial shores and there's no more pain or sorrow. There's no more pain. I'm not going to worry about yesterday. I'm not going to be fearful of death. I'm not going to be fearful of who's talking bad about me. I'm not going to be worried about who's got the next new car or the next boat or the next new house because I'm going to be through the fire walking, amen, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But if your eyes are not focused through the smoke, but on the smoke, you will find yourself many times like Asaph standing at the edge of the cliff. The Bible says in Psalm 73, he said, I, in, in another translation of it, he said, I found myself slipping at the edge of the cliff. And we're going to go a little deeper into this in a moment to paint a better picture for you. But let's look for a moment of what gets you to the edge of the cliff. Asaph's eyes were not focused through the smoke, but they were focused on the proud and the wicked. Where do your eyes go in troubling times? See, the thing about it is, is whether you be sinner or whether you be saint, the world has come so much to be a light that you can't hardly tell the difference between the sinner and the saint. We think that blessings come in the form of finances. If I'm able to buy more stuff, then that means I'm blessed. If I'm able to have more things and go more places and do more things, then that means I'm blessed. That means I'm doing the right thing. That means I must be do under God's will. But David said, don't work, fix your eyes on the wicked people because they're going to be cut off. Let me tell you, there is very, very, I'm not going to say none because I don't know that to be a fact, but I am willing to go this far out on a limb. There are very, very, very few 
good, godly people being rich in the White House, getting rich up there in political offices, getting rich out there on TV. We got folks right now running for governors, using their pastor's pulpit to get a vote, amen, and very few of them are standing behind godly order. The very few people are rich and godly up there. Am I saying that it's impossible to be godly and rich? No, absolutely not. Solomon was a rich man. David came from a rich place, amen. He was a shepherd boy, but they, 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 he, he, he raised up under Saul in his palace. He had this gigantic uh, authority and power that sooner or later finally got to his grasp. We know through all, the, all that. And then you get over here to the New Testament, it's like God said, all right, I've been dealing with rich people all through the New Testament, uh, Old Testament. It ain't working. I need me a fisherman. I need me a tax collector. Come on, I'm going to get one rich man and he's going to be the one that's going to betray me. <laughs> you know, I said that jokingly. But it, the Bible does say that it, it is not impossible for a rich man to make it to heaven. He said, but it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. When I was a little boy, I used to think, it says it's not impossible, but it's easier for a, cow to go, a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And I was like, I've seen my grandma's needles. And it is impossible for a camel to go through the eye of that needle. But it's not impossible for a rich man to go to heaven, but it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Then I've done this thing along the journey. It's called strike, study. And I realized that the gate that those camels would pass by, they didn't have any room to walk through at an angle. They couldn't stop in the middle and scratch their ear. They couldn't turn around and say, come on. They had to hit that gate perfect. It was just big enough for the camel to fit through, but the gate was called the eye of the needle or the needle. And I realized, okay, so grandma's needle, it was impossible, but God knew what he was talking about. And I find that oftentimes, usually when I start questioning God's word, there's something I hadn't found out yet. It's not that God forgot I messed up. Usually it's something I haven't discovered yet. But the, the world fixed their eyes on blessings. And usually people can be content in their lives until they're expecting worldly blessings. Man, Brother Josh, I've been serving the Lord, and I feel like God's wanting me to start this business. And they go, I'm like, man, hey, if God's telling you to do it, he's got, he's got you. And they run out there, and they start this business, and it just begins to crumble. That person that was so on fire for God, now they're like, I just don't understand, Brother Josh. I don't understand. You've got people out here, and they're, they're cussing folks out on Facebook, and they're, they're, they're ranting and raving, but, and they go to church one day a, a year, and they, they, they just get blessed. Everything they touch, they get blessed. We've all been there if we want to be truthful. We've all been frustrated of trying, and it seems like nothing has ever comes in return. I get real frustrated when, you know, I pay taxes all year long. And I got family members that go get a job long enough to pay about $200 in taxes. And then they live off the stamps the rest of the year. And come tax time, I owe somebody money, and they getting $10,000 returns. And I'm like, it don't matter what I do, it's not enough. I know I'm the only one in this room that's ever argued about my taxes. But it's frustrating. But this is what I have to realize. Money, I'm going to quote Benjamin Franklin. Can I do that? It is impossible for money to buy a man happiness. It is not in its nature to produce happiness. Benjamin Franklin said that. He's a $100 bill face. I like a bunch of Benjamins in my pocket. And he's the man that said it is impossible for money to buy a man happiness. And he said it is not in its nature to produce happiness. I'm going to prove that here in just a moment. But what effect does the prosperity of the wicked have on a believer? The psalmist says in Psalm 73, verse 10 through 12, Therefore, this is talking about God's people. He goes all through Psalm 73 and he's talking about, man, they don't ever have any trouble. Uh, I, they don't have any problems. It seems like they just get rich. They don't ever have to want anything. They're, they're healthy. They don't get sick. And no matter what they do, they get good families. Their kids are the starting pitchers on the baseball team and the football team and their kids are the jocks at school, and everybody loves them. My kid's getting picked on. And then he says, therefore, in Psalm 73, 10, his people return hither, 
and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doeth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in knowledge. As a distress, as the, the, the distress for Asaph intensified and began to consume the psalmist, he began to do what many Christians of today do. He questioned if his efforts to live a life of dedication to God were all in vain. Have you ever been there? You just say, man, why do I even try? I have. I have. I, I used to tell it jokingly. And I heard another pastor say it's the reason I use it. He said, I quit my job every Sunday night, and I hire myself back Monday morning. Because there's many times you get to the place where you just want to quit. I've told this exact statement to my wife, and I'm not afraid to tell you. I said, Ashley, if God would let me do it, I'd walk away from pastoring today. I said, I can preach the word. I don't need a pulpit. I don't need a, I don't need a pulpit and a microphone to preach and, and tell people about Jesus. I will continue to do that. But if he'll just release me from pastoring, I'll do it. I was going through some trials at this time when I said that. But I was looking at everything around me. My circumstance was so smoky that I wasn't looking through the smoke. I wasn't looking at what God was trying to do. I was just looking at my circumstance. Asaph questioned if his efforts to live a life of dedication to God were all in vain. Psalm 73, 13 through 16. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. The smoke will cause your ability to think straight, to diminish, and cause you to lose your coordination. As the psalmist here, he just talked about how blessed the wicked and the proud were, and how painful and how, how distraught God's people was. But how many of the wicked and proud had a story to tell their children how God delivered them from Egypt? How many times did the wicked and the proud have the, have the opportunity to tell the generations below them how God delivered Daniel from the lion's den, how God delivered the three Hebrew children from the fiery furnace, how God put honey in a lion for Samson, how God, amen, put up a serpent, a, a statue of a serpent in the wilderness, and, and, and snake bit people were healed by just looking upon the serpent, or how Moses struck a rock when they were thirsty, and it poured out water not once but twice, amen. Amen. How many times? That was they able to go in there and talk about how Peter, amen, was crucified upside down and he never once wavered at that point. He went from denying Jesus on one cross, amen, to professing him and confessing him on another cross, amen. He went, how about the ones that went from Paul who walked to the chopping block and says to live is Christ and to die is gain, amen. Or John who was boiled in hot grease, many scholars believe, and didn't die so they placed him on the island of Patmos and God said, I love you just enough that in your solitary confinement I'm going to give you one of the greatest books to ever be written that will reveal the truth of my word that will come forth in days to come throughout the generations of head and when you see these things you will know amen just because he wouldn't give up and wouldn't quit oh but they got money you don't understand Josh they got a new car and here I am driving my hoopty listen it's always more comfortable to wake up and know your car is going to crank. I, I remember many days getting up in the morning time and have to go to school and having to walk out to my truck before daylight with a hot cup of water and pour it on my windshield so that when I got ready to leave, the ice would be fro uh, the thawed out. But I love that truck with everything in me. You couldn't, uh, to this day, I've still been looking for a truck, that same model for my son. And can't find one. Y'all can find them, but they're ridiculous. It's a 87 Toyota four-wheel drive with a 22 RE engine. If you got one, want to help a preacher out, see me after church. <laughs> Amen. But are the wicked, the, the thing about it is it, it causes us, our coordination in our minds to diminish. 
We're looking at their prosperity. And that's their reward. That's their blessing. There are so many people that feel like if I will just build a, a great life, then my kids won't ever have. And listen, that's a, good, that's a good way to be a parent. I am not. I do that. I am steadily trying to think of ideas that when I'm gone, my kids will already have a paved road. But I don't want to take every speed bump out of their path. Because there comes a day that they're going to need to slow down. And I want to make sure I leave enough ruts and I leave enough speed bumps behind me that my kids don't get so spoiled that while they're driving, they think life is just this easy. Amen. I don't want my kids to believe that, that you get you eat without working when the Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Amen. I don't want my kids to think that you just get handed everything that comes to you. When, 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 my, when I was taught that you work for what you get. Amen. Take pride in working for something and it being your own. Don't just let the world give it to you because if there comes a season where the world's giving it to you, thank you, stimulus check, where the world's giving it to you, there's going to come a day when the world wants to take it back from you and you can't fight it. Because you didn't earn it. We all wanted a stimulus check. Until gas prices are $5.50 a gallon. And, and, and a rat bottle of ranch is $8 a bottle. And, and, and pesticide, a, a, a roundup that used to cost me $40, cost me $200 now. But all we wanted to know was where my stimulus check. And listen, that, that, it, was, it, it, it helped a lot of people. It hurt a lot of people. It's still going to have an effect. But that's the problem. When you look at the smoke, you only see what you're doing now. The Bible tells us where there is no vision, people perish. Don't just look at where you're at. Look at where you're going. Is, what, is where I'm going worth it? When I go on vacation, my, my, we, we took our camper to South Carolina because my little boy, had to go have his shoulders checked out at a Shriners Hospital in South Carolina to see if they could do surgery to help repair his arm. And I knew that at 569 a gallon, that Cummins diesel wasn't going to be friendly. And I got on there and I looked at the most direct path to where I could drop that camper. And I could have took off, but what would have happened if I'd have been on that direct path and I'd have hit a traffic jam? That would have sat me for four hours just idling. It might have been beneficial to go the hard way. To get there to where I'm going. A vision, a plan, according to God's will, is what's going to get you through the fiery furnaces. It's what's going to get your marriage. So many marriages are broken. And nine times out of ten when they sit down, they want to fix the problems. They don't want to fix What's missing? What's, where's your prayer life? Well, I mean, I, I, I pray in, when I'm in the shower. Well, I don't want to know what you look like praying in the shower. And I hope that you, you can give God a little bit more than what you look like praying in the shower. Don't stop praying in the shower, but find somewhere else where you clothed and pray to God. Amen? I'm just telling you my own preference. You pray anywhere you can. But, but pray more than just where it's convenient. You ask them, how's the relationship with God? I mean, we believe. But you want your problems fixed, but you don't want the problem solver in it. God has to be the center. Well, I don't understand why my business is crumbling. What are you trying to gain through your business? I don't understand why my children are rebelling. What kind of relationship are you trying to build with your children? Is it based off of making him the best ball player or making him the best golly man with character? Is it best based off of making her the, 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 the prom queen or is it based off of making her a woman that loves who she is and says that if any man ever, ever sees this, it's going to be because they've shown me the love God shows them. So I ask you this morning, are the wicked really rich? Again, Benjamin Franklin once said, money has never made a man happy, nor will it. There is nothing in its nature to produce happiness. I used to say this all the time. Money can't make a man rich, but a boat that money buys can. But when I get in context of what Benjamin said, I can understand a little bit more. 
See, money can buy medicine, but money can't buy help. Money can buy a bigger house, but money can't buy a peaceful home. Money can buy expensive watches, but money can't buy time. Money can buy books and education, but money can't buy knowledge and wisdom. Money can buy the latest gadgets and toys, but it can't buy character and integrity. Money can buy a life of leisure, but it can't buy a life of purpose and meaning. Money can buy sexual pleasure, but it can't buy loving intimacy. Money can buy acquaintances, but it can't buy genuine friends. Robin Williams was one of my favorite characters growing up. Mrs. Doubtfire, Jumanji, the genie. He was the genie in Aladdin. So many movies he played in and made people laugh. And one of his quotes before he killed himself was some people spend their whole life making people smile so that they don't have to live like they do. And I, I don't know if that's the exact words, but basically I spend my whole life making people smile so they don't have to feel like I feel. There was something missing in his life, but he had money. He should have been happy. His kid's life, his kids would have never had to work for anything. He should have been happy. I'm here to tell you today, if you set your riches up on this earth, this is where your reward is going to be. But if you set your riches up in heaven, there will your reward be also. See, the distraction of wealth and fame has destroyed sinner and saint alike. When you and I place value on the wrong things, it will leave us empty and discouraged every time. I go back to a few of my Christian friends over the years that I've heard say this. We just actually had a conversation about this last night. But I hear them say, it ain't right. I've been serving God my whole life. I pay my tithes and my offerings. I come at church every time the doors are open. But it seems like all of my enemies are just blessed. But I think back, have these people really looked at and mirrored their own lives? Is it that you're not blessed? Or is it that you don't know how to handle your blessings? I see some folks get that $10,000 tax return on Tuesday. And by Friday, they broke. Because they don't know how to handle a blessing. And then I see some people take $800 and save it and invest it. And use it. And $800 turns into $1,600. And $1,600 turns into $3,200. And $3,200 turns into $6,400. And it just keeps growing. And it keeps building. But somewhere along the line, every time it multiplies, they reach in and say, thank you, Lord, for your blessing. And then they, they sow into seed into ministry. They sow seed into a community. They sow seed at the local YMCA, helping children. Whatever it is, they are utilizing their blessing to be a blessing and they never complain that they're not blessed but then you got that one that gets that $10,000 bonus and they throw it away and then I don't understand why so and so is blessed but because when you got your 10000 they got 800 but when they use their 800 and work on it now it's June and you're broke and your, your brand new car is getting repoed your boat just got drug out your yard you're living in the, you're in the shower and somebody's hooking up to your trailer hitch and dragging your mobile, do, mobile home down the road while you're in the shower It ain't that you wasn't blessed. You didn't handle your blessing. But the thing about it is, is God wasn't worried about your checkbook in the first place. God wasn't worried about when your light bill was due. God wasn't worried about you getting to eat shrimp instead of getting to eat bologna. When you and I place value in the wrong things, it will leave us empty and discouraged every time. As the musicians come and I get ready to land this thing, the proverb says, do not be hastily to get rich. Don't toil, don't, don't work yourself tired and broke physically to get rich. Then Jesus goes on in Matthew 16, 26 and helps us settle an argument. He says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? 
And then he goes on to affirm the proverb in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, 21. 19, verse 6, or chapter 6, I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue-tied. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. Lay, to, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doeth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doeth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, the smoke of the wicked prospering really, really just rubbed Asaph the wrong way. But see, Asaph was missing his opportunity to be blessed while writing. Because Asaph had a father. That David saw the same thing that Asaph saw in Psalm 37. But he said, don't become evildoers. These people look like they're blessed. These people smell like they're blessed. These people walk like they're blessed. They talk like they're blessed. And they laugh at us who are over here struggling and sick and, and, and being tormented by the enemy and being bound and thrown into fires and, and being, being thrown into pits and sold into slavery. They laugh at us. David said, but whatever you do, do not become as one of them evildoers. Because God will cut them off from the earth. God is going to cut them off. He is going to cut them off. Their riches and their blessings, their glory is now. But God's is eternal. God's will never end. If you get his blessing, it will be greater than anything you could ever imagine. His greatness, his glory, his power and his authority is enough to lead you, guide you, and direct you through all fiery furnaces. Those three Hebrew children had to face the fire in faith. But when they entered the fire, they entered with a vision that said they're able to say, but even if he don't. God is able to say, but even if he don't, we still won't bow. They was able to see through the smoke. Who's ever seen that movie Fireproof? He told us, the man told him, the captain, when he was going through trouble, he glued the salt and pepper together. He said, you never leave your partner in a fire. Never leave your partner in a fire. Coming up through the military, one of the prime things that you're drilled and taught is you are your brother's keeper. You have their six. They have your six. You have to be able to trust each other. You can't get out there in the battlefield and think that the one that's been talking to you this whole time is going to buck and turn and, and, and wave the right flag and run on you when you need him to guard your back. You need the people around you that are going to hold your six, that are going to cover you, that aren't going to give up, that aren't going to tuck tail, that aren't going to run. They're not going to leave you in the fire. They're not going to leave you in the heat of a battle. But they're going to keep their eyes fixed through the smoke. They're going to use the vision of God, not the vision that they see. <clears throat> and they're not going to allow the smoke to cloud their judgment, cloud their understanding. The enemy is notorious for putting up a smoke screen to try to cause you to question or to doubt or to become delusional or to lose your coordination. But God is calling you to a higher place. God is calling you to a greater thing. And I can't promise you that you're going to be able to buy the house of your dreams. I wish I could, but I can't. And I can't promise you that you're going to be able to have all the gadgets but I do know the Bible says that if you'll be faithful in the small things, I will make you ruler of many. I know some good, godly men that are very financially stable, but it's because they love the Lord, and it's because they serve the Lord, and it's because that they don't look at their riches as their blessing. They look at it as their opportunity to be a blessing. We are living in a day and an hour where people are more consumed with the things they can touch, feel, hear, and taste 
They're trying to understand heaven while having that mentality. When the Bible plainly says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and neither has entered into the heart of, the man, of man the things that God has prepared, but the Spirit hath revealed it to them. The Spirit has to reveal it. The Spirit has to show you. You can't walk in the Spirit and in the flesh. Those two war with each other. If you're gonna, if you're gonna get through the smoke, if you're gonna get through the fire, if you're gonna get through the fire as a family, if you're gonna get through the fire as a ministry, if you're gonna get through the fire as a as a preacher, as a doctor, as a business owner, if you're gonna get through the fire, you're gonna have to go through the fire knowing that I can't focus on what's going on right now. I can't get caught up with what's being said over here on the news. I can't be caught up with what's going on over here with gas prices and what's going over here on in political problems. I've got to fix my eyes on the Word of God and it will lead God and direct me. When I go blind, the Bible says the Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I don't know where his next step to take, he says he, the God orders a righteous man's step. Amen. He says he knows which way to go. When you don't know which way to go, follow the Lord. As a firefighter, I would hold that heat imagery. I could see fire in the walls. Wherever there was heat, I could see. I knew where to go. When I walk through the fires today spiritually, if I hold this out, it tells me where to go. It tells me what to do. It tells me how to live. It tells me who to trust. It tells me where to put my faith. It tells me where to put my, my goals. It tells me where to put my riches. It tells me how to save my money. It tells me how to start my business. It tells me how to be a friend. It tells me how to be a husband. It tells me how to be a son. It tells me how to be a daughter. It tells me how to be a church member. It tells me how to pastor. It tells me, amen, how to raise my children. Every question that I have ever had, it tells me. So I'm here today, as you stand all over the house this morning, to ask you, have you ever found yourself like Asaph? I just feel like what I've done is in vain. Some of you have been in ministries for years, and just recently, maybe God shifted you. Or maybe he's shifting your ministry or he's calling you into a, a, a different direction or calling. And maybe you feel like what you've done has been for nothing. Don't let the enemy tell you that lie. Everything you've done has led you to where you are today. I'm not telling you that everything you've done was right. Because I know everything I've done wasn't right. Man, I've made some bad decisions. I've done some, I've made some, I've been... Just forgive me for saying like this, but I've just been stupid sometimes. But God even took my ignorance. He took my failures, and I am where I am today because God used them for my good. And maybe you're going through things that are trying to cause you to feel like you've wasted life, you've wasted time. Don't let the enemy deceive you. Maybe you thought at this point in your life you was going to be on a big stage somewhere. Or you was going to have a congregation of thousands of people. Or you were going to be a multi-million dollar business owner. And you're not there. So you just feel like you failed your family. You failed your church. You failed your life. and That's a lie. You're standing right here today because you didn't fail. You're standing right here today because you knew where your family needed to be. You're standing right here today because you knew what it takes to be a man, what it takes to be a woman, what it takes to be a father, what it takes to be a mother. You're standing here today because God's got a plan for you. And yes, the smoke, sometimes it gets hard. And sometimes you don't go right into the house and find what you're looking for. And it takes trouble. But that's where two or three together, gathered in His name, comes into play. I read a thing this week, and I know my dad says it all the time. You know, people say, you don't, I don't have to go to church to go to heaven. You're right. And you don't need a parachute to jump out of an airplane. But it helps. And also read something this week says, for those of you that think you don't need a church body to go to heaven, I want to tell you, you don't need to go home to be married. But it sure helps the relationship.
where two or three together, and this is from my experience in house fires, when you know you've got somebody missing in the fire, but the fire's getting hotter, there comes a point. You know, if you want to start a fire, you take a, a lighter and you hold it to a piece of paper, you expect that paper to burn. But in a house fire where everything's closed in and that smoke is steadily rolling, that smoke is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And there's things you can look for in the smoke that tells you what it's about to do. But there comes a point in a room. If I'm in this room and I'm standing way over here and the fire's over there and I'm crawling around and I'm looking, there's some signs I can look for that'll tell me. But once the smoke in the air gets so hot... The flame is over there. I'm safe. But once the smoke gets so hot, there's a thing called flashpoint. It is about a 98% chance you're going to die if you're in a room that flashes over. Very few people live in a flashover, live through a flashover. So that's where it's good when you're in the fire that you didn't go into that fire thinking that you G.I. Joe and you're going to take hell with a water pistol. But you knew God gave me brothers and sisters. God gave me leaders. God gave me people that I'm going to help lead. And to learn to work together because there's going to come a time when you're in the room and it's about to flash over. And now the one that went in to save, his life's in jeopardy. That you're going to need somebody that's smart enough to get on the roof and ventilate and let the smoke out before it gets too hot. And then another team's going to come in and put water on the fire. That way you never have to quit looking for the lost soul, the lost lamb, the lost one, the one that got away. Because that one lost person might be your prodigal son. It might be your prodigal daughter. It might be your wife. It might be your husband. It might be your mama or your daddy or your brother or your sister. It might be your best friend. It might be your co workers you don't give up until they're all walking out in the fire with you you keep searching you keep fighting and trust your buddy to ventilate when there needs ventilation trust your buddy to walk through the flames with you and not let go i want to tell you i don't care if you've been at northwest church for 50 years or if you've been here going on 50 minutes or however long i've been preaching i want to tell you I can't speak for nobody else in this room, but I got a good feeling. I got a lot of folks that agree. If you're here this morning, if you're watching online, you got some folks right now that will walk through the fire with you. They ain't going to let you walk by yourself. They ain't going to let you walk by your. I got folks that ain't even a part of Northwoods, but you've been serving God long enough. There's an unction on the inside of you, and you've been hungry. You've been passionate about stepping in. God said, get ready. I need you to carry some folks through the fire. I need you to push in. I need you to press. Don't give up. Don't walk out. You're not too far gone. I didn't give up on you. Don't give up on me. God saying, I got you right where I want you. Hallelujah. So if you're here this morning and you've been on like Asaph, you've been on the edge of that cliff and your foot slipping and you've been looking at the wrong things and you've made your mind up and no, no, I can't give up. There's too many people still in the fire. I got to get off the edge of this cliff. I got to get back in my ministry. I got to get back in my marriage. I got to get back to my family. I got to get back to my children. Listen, I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. Some of you got some bridges to rebuild. Some of you got to build some bridges. Don't leave this place today thinking God ain't for you just because it's still hard when you leave. You got to build some bridges. It didn't get torn down in a day. It ain't going to be rebuilt in a day. But I dare you to leave with your tool belt on and start working and start building and believing God's got plans for you. The smoke is about to rise. And you're going to see clearly if you'll just stay on the path God's got you on. The path that says he's for you and not against you. With every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Father, I just ask you this morning to move in your people. Move in me. Move from the stage. Move through the pews. Move through the back. Move to those watching online. God, I feel strong in my spirit. There are some people that's been at the edge. They've been at the edge spiritually where they've, been, they've almost given up on you, Lord. But, Lord, I feel like there's somebody 
Somebody's been at the edge physically. And I rebuke the spirit of suicide in the name of Jesus. Because God, their life is worth living. They've got a purpose. They've got a plan. You've got a plan for them, God. And I rebuke every lie the enemy has spoken against them. And God, they're coming away from the edge. They're coming away from the edge right now, God. And their hands are going to be lifted in victory. Because God, you will fight their battles. You wage war against their enemies. You cut the evildoers off from the land, and the earth shall be theirs, God. Lord, they're not going to walk in distress any longer. They're gonna, not going to walk depressed any longer, but they're going to stand in the gap, and they're going to know, God, that you are able and you are worthy to be praised, and you're going to lift them up out of the miry clay and set their feet upon a rock. God, for those that have maybe lost focus because of the, fo- the fire and smoke in their life, And maybe, like all of us have at some point been guilty of looking at the wrong things as blessings. God, I believe that you're going to give clarity of vision today. They're going to be able to look on their left and they're going to see their blessing. They're going to be able to look on their right and they're going to see their blessing. They're going to take a breath of oxygen into their lungs and they're going to realize they are blessed. God, they're going to leave this place today and they're going to realize they are blessed. And God, I thank you. I thank you that you are pulling them back from the edge even as we speak. I'm going to ask them to begin praising, just just praising God in whatever song he's laid on their heart. And I want to open these altars. If you're here this morning and you've been at the edge or you've been in the fire, or you've been in the smoke, or maybe you're here today and you felt like you've lost your ability to help. You've lost your ability to work in the fire. And you're ready to, you're accepting what I'm telling you. You're not done. God's still got a plan for you. You're not done. You're not done. That plan is still in motion. If God has begun a good work, he shall perform it unto the day. Amen. Don't give up. He hasn't given up on you. This is your time. But I want to open these altars to anybody, whether you be on the edge of the cliff, whether you be on the edge of your ministry, the edge of life. Amen. And maybe you feel like you're no good to the fire, the people in the fire. God said, I want to restore you. Y'all want to restore your joy. I want to restore Story. I want to remove the smoke out of your eyes so that you can see your joy again. Hallelujah. As they begin worshiping, these altars are open.